Coming up on Tech News Today, Yahoo's got a new CEO. Just like the old CEO, we'll compare them side by side. Also, new Apple MacBooks rumored, Windows 8 rumors, and even a non-rumor solution to piracy by ruining BitTorrent. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Monday, May 14th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by ShareFile. Send files of almost any size easily and securely with ShareFile by Citrix. Try ShareFile today free for 30 days, plus get double storage. Here's how. Visit ShareFile.com, click the radio microphone, and enter our promo code TNT. And by Gazelle, the easy way to sell your iPhone, iPad, iPod, or Android smartphones from your home or office so you can get the latest versions. Get a risk-free quote that's good for 30 days at gazelle.com. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Maya Zaktar. I'm OMG Chad. And we've got one more day of Chad Johnson before Jason Howell comes back. Chad, thank you uh, for your service. No problem. I serve gladly. <laughs> <laughs> also joining us today, uh, host of Scam School, Brian Brushwood. I look forward to seeing this program sometime. Scam School, it sounds delightful. It sounds like a good way to learn about social engineering at the bar and on the street. That's what it sounds like, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah. you always do your show from the bar and on the streets, but you also have a yes. book. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you, would you be talking about scamschoolbook.com? In fact, I got a scoop for you. At the end of this, uh, we're going to reveal... Tomorrow is supposed to be when I reveal it, but I'll reveal it today what? when we're going to release Scoop. book two. All right. All right. Can't wait to find out about that. In the meantime, it's time to play Wheel of Yahoo CEOs. We don't have an intro for that or anything. But Scott Thompson stepped down on Sunday as a CEO of Yahoo. Uh, quote, for personal reasons, he lasted four months in the job. Uh, so Carol Bart still outlasted him, you know, when you... Put him side by side. Reportedly, he told the board he was diagnosed with thyroid cancer, uh, and he received the diagnosis after the investigation began, and that may have played a part in the personal reasons for him stepping down. But, of course, uh, Dan Loeb was requesting that he be removed because of the questions about his resume and uh, the implication that he had said that he had a computer science degree and that he didn't have a computer science degree, and there was a lot of controversy and a lot of investigation happening. However, uh, Ross Levinson is now the CEO of Yahoo, at least the interim CEO. He was previously the head of global media. They've also had a huge shakeup on the board. Dan Loeb won this one. Uh, they have named Fred Amoroso as chairman of the board of the directors. Uh, Daniel Loeb, Harry J. Wilson, and Michael J. Wolf will join the Yahoo board. That will all happen effectively May 16th. And people who have said they would not stand for re-election are swept aside. Roy Bostock's gone, Patty Hart's gone, VJ Joshi, Arthur Kern, and Gary Wilson. Uh, all will not stand for re-election. So uh, it's, it's a clean sweep. We've got a new chairman of the board. We've got a new CEO. Levinson was the guy Loeb wanted in the first place. Levinson was kind of up for the job when Thompson came out of nowhere and took it. And I'm people are assuming that he's going to campaign to keep that job and have that interim title removed. And not only are these board members not going to stand for re-election, but they're stepping down from the board immediately. So it is, it's quite a swap. Uh, a lot of stuff happened over the weekend. Yeah, effective May 16th, you get a whole new board. I think Loeb was going after what it was Morse or Levinson, so he did get Levinson in. And it makes sense considering that Yahoo was supposed to be like a media company, and that's what Levinson did. He was the head of the global media division. And, I, I mean, he used to, I, I believe he uh, was at News Corp when they bought MySpace. So at least he had the force, foresight to do the acquisition of it. Whether they ran it well or not, I don't think that was his, his division. Has anyone checked his resume? I'm pretty sure that somebody, maybe Loeb himself, checked the resume. I'm sure a lot of the board will. And if, if they didn't, I'm, could you imagine this happening a second time? I wouldn't, I wouldn't anyone, see that. Does anyone else feel like we're just seeing the ripples on the surface and all the interest? I don't believe any of this is exactly what it seems to be. I don't believe that anyone's really been out of shape about a resume. And, uh, I mean, I do believe he probably has cancer if, if he's saying that's the case. But it's like I just feel like there's some kind of awesome Game of Thrones going on, and we can't see any of it. All We're, we're like the peasants out in the street who just hear, like, oh, you got a new king now. We're like, all right, whatevs. 
I here's what I here's what I think happened. I, I depends I think, on the kingdom. So. I, think I think you're partially right, and I think a lot of it is a, is apparent. I mean, part of this this Game of Thrones move was Dan Loeb saying, "Hey, you know, we we want." More influence in how Yahoo's being run. Yahoo is not being run well. But the thing was, and we he, want Thompson out of there. And he is uh, influential. He owns a, a large stake as a shareholder in Yahoo. But it wasn't like he just was so vocal about it that finally they had to listen to him. They had dirt on Thompson. He he was the one who initially said, "Okay, you don't want me to be have a board seat. You don't think I'm up for the job? Well, guess what." Your CEO doesn't have a degree that he said it, that he had, Your and that was son true. Isn't even the legitimate heir, it's, right? <laughs> yeah, it's totally, it's it's totally like you know. You wouldn't believe who his dad is. Sending, they sent the <laughs> Raven out with like the questions about Thompson's resume, the game of Yahoo CEO. You win or you step down. It's not quite as bad <laughs> as Game of Thrones. Uh, now, Thank all goodness. things D reporting that Thompson will be dismissed with cause, and if that turned out to be true, he would get no severance. It would also mean that Yahoo found evidence that he had, in fact, uh, known about the inaccuracy on his resume that was filed with the SEC. Because remember, that's the big thing. What was posted on the Internet, not a big thing. What was filed with the SEC uh, from Yahoo, that's, that's what puts the company under the threat of liability. And if they find out that, you know, that was done with knowledge or, or maliciously, uh, that could that could put Yahoo in a lot of hot water. And so they would want to remove him and could remove him with cause if that were the case. If it does turn out that the thyroid cancer story is true uh, and that this is all just bad timing and he, like you know, it would be horrible to get diagnosed with that. It's a, it's a treatable and curable form of cancer. But nonetheless, anyone who has to fight cancer is not going to want to also fight for their job mm -hmm. and, and a hostile board member. Uh, I mean, it could have so been the case that, that he would have had to step down anyway. Yeah, exactly. It's, just, it's, it's strange timing. Is there any chance that they're sort of, because these, these are all unconfirmed at this point, right? Well, the uh, cause, the Thompson for cause and and the thyroid cancer are both unconfirmed. The, the thyroid cancer is being reported by the Wall Street Journal with sources. So it, it, there's a little more confidence in that rumor. So uh, all Things D is only reporting that they have a source saying he would be dismissed with cause. That's That's got a little less confidence to it. Do you think there's any chance that they're just floating that out to see what the reaction is? Because, I mean, there's there's a significant dollars... Dollar cost that they would save if they were able to fire him with cause. No, I don't, I don't think that's how you do it at all. You don't you don't float it out to the press. You look at your you get your legal team on it and you say, can we fire him with cause? They say yes or no, and then you do it. You don't you don't try it out in the public marketplace. God, man, but you don't think there's going to be a backlash if he's like you're like, wow, he got cancer, fired with cause. Uh, no, it's about not right resume. now. Everyone hates Scott Thompson, you know, for for good or ill. Uh, the yeah. valley is not on his side. Well, and and even just think of the timing of it is like. This all happened before he told anybody that he had he was compromising, you know, with a medical situation. So that doesn't really apply to what actually went wrong. The fact that his resume was incorrect is the issue. You're fired without cause because of that. The medical issue just happens to have come up during the same time, but it's not really part of the deal. Okay, let's let's go to something with a little less substance. Rumor mill. <laughs> And uh, and some benchmarks and, and little leaks here and there. The yeah. MacBook's on the way. MacBook Pros will be refreshed. I know that sounds like a crazy idea because it happens every year around the same time. But yes, but how and when? Yes, let's talk about how and when, what's going to be different. Actual 9 to 5 Mac has a report saying the new MacBook Pros are coming out in the summer. Thinner design, and they have some mock-ups. You're going to see some images if you're watching the video version. These are mock-ups. They would be a thinner, uh, thinner version of the current design. Wouldn't be a wedge shape like the Air. They're citing trusted sources in Apple supply chain who've handled prototype components and casings. Now, for specs, we're looking at Ivory Bridge, which is expected, a Retina display, USB 3.0, two Thunderbolt ports, and what, what's getting thrown out, no more optical drive. Ethernet port was not on the prototypes, and maybe even FireWire might be out. Graphics card information is currently unconfirmed. Now, the, you, you, the FireWire disappearing, I think, is almost a done deal. Like, mm -hmm. FireWire's all but, but dead. But Ethernet? Getting rid of Ethernet on a MacBook Pro, I would be very disappointed in. Yeah, because if you're going to make these things thinner, I've noticed this on the Ultrabooks, there's usually a bump out for the Ethernet port. And Apple's not exactly one to go, oh, yeah, we're going to make our design a little fatter because of the Ethernet port. I think it's strange that a MacBook Pro would get rid of that. I would hope they would include that USB adapter that they 
they have on the MacBook Airs that are optional. Uh, backing all this up, Mac Rumors forums noted that Geekbench had had seen references to MacBook Pro nine comma one. Now the current MacBook Pro is eight comma x, you know, one two three whatever. Now shows Intel Ivy Bridge Core i seven with uh, running at two point seven gigahertz. In addition, the Geekbench result also shows it's running OS ten Mountain Lion. So people are thinking that that MacBook Pro will come out in in uh, the summer with Mac with Mountain Lion at the same time. Also seen at Geekbench is iMac 13 II, which everyone thinks is a 27-inch uh, running Intel Ivy Bridge Core i7-3770 quad-core running at 3.4 gigahertz, so that's pretty snazzy, also running Mountain Lion. And these benchmarks have appeared before at, at Geekbench, so that's, you've seen you that mean, a couple times. When you say these benchmarks, you mean these benchmarks of unreleased prototypes? That's cetera, correct. So like when, when 8 was coming out, 7 They was, are easily faked. Yes. You can. So that doesn't mean somebody faked them, but they, they could be fake. But this next piece is real, though. Best Buy has cut uh, prices of all Macs, which usually means that they're, they want to get rid of all their inventory, which probably means new Macs are coming in. So the timing seems about right, especially with WWDC coming up, what, in a couple of weeks. I'd give mm-hmm. this like a 67% chance of being true, uh, all told. Arbiter points out Thunderbolt can be used as an Ethernet port. Yes. So I could, use- I could definitely see Apple saying, yeah, you just buy a Thunderbolt adapter and that's your Ethernet port. Because what did it say? Two Thunderbolt ports? Mm-hmm. Two Thunderbolt ports. There USB go. 3.0 as well. You could always use either one for that option because, yeah. well, they're, they're flexible. I would use Thunder. I would use the Thunderbolt port because it's got a lot more put throughput. But uh, And you can daisy chain. Yeah, and you do one gigabit per second on yeah. Thunderbolt. And it doesn't degrade the Ethernet connection at all? Nope. Just because... Not to carry it. Yeah. But it's definitely Designed a more expensive brand, adapter. Uh, oh, yeah, relatively. Apple didn't care about that. <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm just saying, from <laughs> but the yeah, practical yeah. standpoint, sure. if you're looking at this, uh, I, 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 I just have a hard time losing that Ethernet port. Well, they'll sell you, they'll sell you a nice cinema display that'll connect to the Thunderbolt port, the Thunderbolt port and have an Ethernet That's jack the only on way it. you'll get Ethernet. It's just through the cinema display. That's yeah. the accessory. Like when you buy the... Uh, if you don't want to buy the dongle, that's, that's your other option. And that uh, th- cinema display will also be the new Apple television. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Brian, you don't care about any of this stuff, huh? You know, I'm staying uh, taxfully quiet right here. I- I'm having this weird flirtation with Apple hardware. You know, I'm, 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 ho- I'm loving my iOS devices, love my iPad, and it just seems like I should complete the ecosystem. And I feel like I'm being seduced. But I, I tell you, I got way turned off by the talk about getting rid of the 17-inch laptop for spending as much time on the road as I do. I want a nice, big, fat, beautiful display. I don't want no tiny 15 inches. See, the 17 is too big for me, but I, 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 I know that there are people like you who swear by it. Uh, and so I think that I'm curious whether that is a mistake to get rid of the 17-inch model altogether. Let's move on to more rumor mill. Uh, this is also involving Apple. Wall Street Journal reporting iCloud will get new features announced at WWDC as part of iOS 6. This seems pretty likely to happen. Whether these will be the features or not is the big question. Wall Street Journal saying uh, the big feature would be a way to share photo galleries with other iCloud users, uh, which happened, did exist in Mobile Me before, but actually in this rumor, you would get the ability to comment on other people's photos. So it'd be a little more like Instagram. I like this idea. I, I never thought much of Mobile Me's photo album capability. I was a it's Mobile Me basic. user. It was pretty basic. And I felt like sometimes I'd try to share a photo with somebody. And for whatever reason, the link that they got that was supposed to be public wouldn't work. So it was pretty clunky. clunky but you almost have nowhere to go but up, really, after that. And you couldn't comment on anybody's photos. And I like the idea of if I have an iOS device and I'm taking a lot of pictures, I've got my photo stream. Then I've got my iCloud photos that are definitely shared. And then the uh, camera roll for stuff that's locally. I like the idea of sectioning all that stuff out to to choose to share certain pictures with some people. But I I mean, good luck being an Instagram killer. This is It, just, it seems like it would be something that's a little bit more, hey, I went on this big vacation. Here's a collection of photos that might rival uploading them all to something like Facebook. Sure, more with More than your something family, like Instagram. Instead of making them sit in your house while you show them the pictures. Yeah. Yeah. On a slideshow. Because mm. I took it with slide film. On my those parties? cinema display. Dating myself a little yeah. bit. Yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't surprise me if Apple, with the way they are with iOS 6 and Mountain Line, if you you'd post comments with Twitter. I mean, because they, they've tried their own social network thing. I don't know if you want to use your Apple ID for this kind of stuff because that's tied to credit card information. I would I would could easily see you'll have your gallery up and you'll go, I'm going to log in as, to comment using Twitter because everyone's already got well, not everyone. A lot of people have that already. And Apple's really buddy-buddy with them these days. Yeah, but you're going to log in with your iCloud 
email address. So why would... I mean, why for would, comments then. So that why, way they can why, have That seems clunky to me. It's like, oh, I, we know you're logged in with your, with your iCloud address, but now we're going to make you log in with another address to do commenting. That doesn't seem very Apple. Um, well, I'm just thinking like... Think if, this is ping for photos. Oh, you beat me to it. That's what I was going to say. Ah, that's and and I don't know if that's if that's justifiable or not, but it, it's it smells tiny to me. It smells like like high-minded like ping and nobody'll use it or not be used enough and then we just won't hear about it again. I I yeah, I can I that that's that's all we have to say apparently about <laughs> Well, no, no, I mean okay, th- that might be true, but it's like if you have um if you're really, really organized with something like iPhoto, you take advantage of iPhoto events and collections and uh, you're backing that stuff up and iCloud would be a perfect place to do that and it's something that you're sharing with family and friends. I mean, I don't see this as like a terrible idea. The execution might not be amazing, but I think they should have a way to be able to share photo albums, especially since um, iDevices are a great way for people to take a lot of really good photos now. I mean, how many but, videos go up to YouTube just because it's an option? Send to YouTube. If it's just said sent to iCloud or send publicly, and you don't even know what that is, you don't really care, you go, that's going to go that way. Because, I mean, well, the iPhone became the number one camera on Flickr for a while because people just take photos with the camera right. they have. If it's just an option that's shared to go send to my gallery or whatever they're going to call it. Or it's it. already there. Like, it just automatically uploads, right? right? So they, they have that integration built in everywhere, so why not put it together and you'll easily do it? Or like, oh opt out. I don't think it's going to be as small as ping because you had to opt into that kind of stuff. You had to be active in this. But people share photos a lot easier than they go, well, I'm getting this on iTunes and I would like to share it with my ping friends. It's like, no, if you go to the web, see the well, and, files. And also think about it from a branding perspective. Like if, if you look at, you know, iTunes means your music library and then they tacked on ping, like then now you can share it with people and it sort of just withered and died there. And likewise, uh, iCloud means backing up your stuff and having your collection of photos, but there's no... Uh, uh, like if you're sharing it with other people, I mean, is there, is there a certain website? It's not like Instagram. Instagram means one thing: sharing your photos with friends, where there's an uh, there's there's a feed, and people know where they want to go to discover their friends' photos. If I say where do you want to go to discover your friends' photos, and you make a grand list, I iCloud, it, I, I don't see any way they could even break into the top five, maybe even the top ten of places you would go to see your friends' photos. We also uh, seen rumors that reminders and notifications would come to the web interface for iCloud. Love this. Also, possibly video sharing uh, along with the photo sharing. Uh, that notes. part I'm a little less yeah. sure about. Well, how it's that kind would of the same awesome. photo conversation, except with video. Same, yeah. same sort of thing. I love I love the the sync reminders coming to the web. I use that app all the time. All right, let's take a break and uh, thank our sponsor. You know, uh, we're talking about sharing things that are personal and things that are fun. But if you're sharing something that's actually essential to your business, you want some assurances that it's going to run efficiently, that it's going to stay confidential, that it's going to get where it's supposed to go. Uh, and that means that you want to try ShareFile from Citrix. You can collaborate on files with colleagues and business partners easily and securely, work effectively away from the office by accessing files from any computer or mobile device anytime. Uh, it, it really is the best way to share files in a business context. If you're like, eh, you know, it's, it's fine to play around with free services, but I need something that I know is going to be easy to use for my client. It's going to be secure from end to end. Citrix is good at that stuff. That's why we recommend ShareFile. ShareFile is secure. It's built specifically for business. It's a powerful tool that helps your business run smoothly, and you can send files of almost any size without the frustration of bounce backs. Uh, collaborate on files securely, completely under your control. You're just sending a link. So it's like you're emailing the file to the person on the other end. They just click the link. Uh, if you want to put a password on it, you can do that. And then they open it up and they get the file. ShareFile is the perfect solution to doing business in today's digital world. We use it here at Twit uh, to share confidential documents with folks. In fact, the other day, uh, I was wishing a company would use ShareFile because they, they wanted me to fax something uh, to, to them. I was like, really? Fax? Come on, guys. Get with ShareFile. Uh, to get started, in fact, we have an amazing risk-free offer for our listeners, a 30-day free trial plus double storage. Uh, in order to get the special offer, visit sharefile.com, click on the radio microphone, and enter our promo code TNT. Remember, double storage. Sign up right now. Visit sharefile.com and type in TNT. And we thank Citrix and Sharefile for their support of Tech News Today. More rumor mill, this time on the Microsoft side of the street. Sources are telling CNET that the first wave of Windows 8 tablets will arrive in stores in November. 
Uh, more than 50% of the one the source knew about are expected to be hybrids and use Intel's Clover Trail. So hybrids meaning they would have a keyboard or some kind of bendy, you know, kind of look like a, a netbook, kind of look like a... That's a new new word for convertible. Bendy. Tablet PCs. Yeah. Now, they're, now they're hybrids. They're part Cylon, part human. <laughs> uh, sources added that Intel has a chip called Bay Trail in the works as well. Uh, would be a 22 nanometer version of Clover Trail. In addition to that, we have some more news on the Windows 8 upgrade plan. We talked about Mary Jo Foley saying she thought an update, upgrade plan would be coming in June for a fee. Uh, and it will only allow you to upgrade to Windows 8 Pro if you bought a Windows 7 machine after June 2nd. Well, Paul Therott bears that out. He says, yeah, it's going to start June 2nd. If you buy a Windows 7 machine, you'll be able to upgrade to Windows 8 Pro for $15 once Windows 8 comes out. Now, you'll also still have the upgrade packs that we've talked about before as, as in, uh, in operating system upgrade purchases. But this will be a special program just for folks who buy Windows 7 machines after June 2nd. And... Triple play on the Windows rumors. Well, this one's not a rumor. The U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee actually does plan to investigate Windows RT browser options. Uh, we talked about Mozilla and Google complaining about the limits placed on what browsers can do when they are alternate browsers on Windows RT. Windows RT is the version for ARM. Uh, there are no plans right now for a public hearing or anything like that. This is just exploratory. They're looking into it. They're having staffers examine the issue to see if it's worth actually conducting meetings about. Uh, back to that whole Windows upgrade for $15 thing. I mean, Ivy Bridge processors in, in laptops are coming now. And I, I know a lot of people in the know, like us, who you know are paying attention to this. Like, should I wait? Should I bother to get a laptop? Or should I wait for Windows 8 to be coming out? So this this seems like it'll stop, well, I guess this, it'll stop stop the cessation of sales it'll well that's, a, it'll that's they always do some bit. sort of program like this but yeah. it's good to have for that, that very reason for 15 bucks to get the pro edition which is the one that's mm -hmm. which is upgradable both of them are upgradable to uh all kinds of packs i just think that's a smart move by microsoft to go look you should buy your laptop now all our partners want you to buy laptops you can get it well, actually in june you in, should buy your laptop june 2nd june, yeah right <laughs> june 2nd don't, don't buy, buy it now it. <laughs> wait for that to come out well that's why microsoft hasn't made this official i'm curious why they're leaking it out like this because when paul therott and mary joe foley report this stuff they know they're finding it out from mm -hmm. somebody so somebody thinks it's not a bad idea to let folks know about it and then as for the as for the tablets i'm thinking about the hybrid if, if intel hybrids are the way to go i mean if, if rt is slowed down you can't run other browsers and you can't run third-party applications or legacy applications in the desktop interface that is I don't see a lot of people picking RT unless they're budget conscious. They're just thinking, "Look, I'm going to get this much cheaper uh, process, this much cheaper form factor." Because, well, if Intel's coming out in November, why just why not just get that one? Well, because it's more expensive. I think you answered your own question yeah. right there. It's too too damned expensive. And a lot of people don't use tablets for fancy stuff. I mean, you know, we the browsing. Few apps here and there. People want the two hundred dollar tablets, mm -hmm. like Samsung Galaxy Tab Two or the Amazon Kindle, Kindle Fire. Fire. You know, that's, yeah, that's it's amazing to me. If you, I mean, back in two thousand three, two thousand four, when the very first uh, hybrid, you know, semi laptop, but like flip it around, you could use a pen stylus on there. I was so excited. Uh, you know, I, I encouraged my buddies to buy them. I I almost bought one. But if you would have told me back then that eight years later they would be, you know, Microsoft would be all in on the tablet game, and there would be a full uh, Windows operating system. And that, you know, completely designed for this experience. And then I would be meh about it. I, I wouldn't have believed you. And yet I'm just shocked at how much of the experience I already get from from my smartphone or from, you know, the iPad or cheaper tablets. I'm 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 wanting so bad. Oh, you have Microsoft them. Office on your smartphone, huh? No. Oh, okay. why would I use Microsoft Office I, on the smartphone? It's uh, it's the point is I want so bad for them to blow me away. Uh, because inside is the same damn <laughs> boy who is so excited, but I just am skeptical of it right now. They're not going to kill you, Ryan. <laughs> Please don't hurt me, Microsoft. No matter how nice you are. No, I, I think I think uh, that is a representative reaction of some people. And uh, please email Brian with your reactions, Microsoft fanboys. Because <laughs> <laughs> you already emailed us. We talked about it last week. Uh, I, I, I am excited about the Metro interface. I think it's great. I think it's a great design, and I can't wait to see how these tablets uh, pan out and how they work in real life. I, I've had fun playing around with Windows 8. I, however, would like to have the fastest router that I can get. Where can I get that, sir? Uh, you can get it from... Buffalo, they are the company who the city. Oh no, the the Buffalo, the people that were the Buffalo, Buffalo Rome in Golden Gate Park. No, not that either. It's actually a company based in um, in Texas who has the first 802.11 AC Wi-Fi product that is actually shipped 
and available. It was sort of a race to the finish line with Netgear, who also announced um, that in May, they were going to be coming out with their own Aha. 802.11ac router. So Buffalo ended up saying, we said summer, but now it's May. Specifically May 14th. Um, so this is an air that station really router. Happens. We should note that somebody says, oh, we're going to release it this day, and then releases early. Yeah. That's pretty cool, Buffalo. Yeah, well, they can say that they were Nicely first. Done. So it's a router, and it's a matching uh, It's a matching bridge. Um, uses the new AC wireless standard, but it is backwards compatible with 802.11 devices, which is good. Because that's yeah, all you're going to be able to use so, right now. Yeah, they're selling a bunch of NICs and wireless cards and things, so I could take advantage of... No, they're not. Yeah, not, that's not actually no. happening yet. <laughs> there are companies, Broadcom, Qualcomm, Quantena, are all examples of uh, companies who are manufacturing chips to make devices 802.11 AC compatible, but that's probably not going to start rolling out until next year. So this is an investment into the future so with this, this is, new router. This is what you do if you know you've got that friend who's going to come along with the laptop that has the 802.11 AC card in it and say like, oh, I got an 802.11 AC card, but I probably won't be able to, whoa. A, a connect you you have that yeah like, I guess, oh yeah I've I had guess that since you could you could you could buy both of these for one hundred one hundred eighty dollars each for bragging rights <laughs> well, so you could be a I hipster. guess you at the very least that could be it. had AC before it was cool like that's what you're gonna have to have to say at that point that's yeah, kind AC? of AC you mean wireless yeah uh, theoretically eight hundred two dot eleven AC is fast three times faster than eight hundred two dot eleven N. Um, it uh, theoretically hits one point three gigabit per second peak speeds on the five gigahertz band on computers and mobile devices that can handle it. Um, also supports 2.4 gigahertz at 450 megabits per second um, as an option. The router has four Ethernet jacks. And the deal is, is that the IEEE is expected to ratify the standard next year. Hmm. So again, a lot of this stuff is, what are you guys laughing at? I'm just thinking of these you're, meetings okay, yeah, I, I had know what you're gonna say. in yeah. 2004 at CNET where they're like, all right, well, uh, Buffalo, and I believe Buffalo was one of the companies, has come out with a, a pre-N router. Uh, IEEE is supposed to ratify this next year. And then 2005, yeah, they're still going to ratify it. Or do that next yeah. year. Okay, yeah. so. okay, that's fine. But it's They like, may be faster if this there, time. If there are chips being made for this right now, maybe we don't have Science Seal delivered as far as official goes, but... This is the way that we're going. A lot of those draft N routers were upgradable firmware-wise. So you, it would run N once that finally became finalized. But that took mm -hmm. so long. And IEEE has been notoriously slow when it comes to making the standard. The issue that comes up is when you have incompatible cards and routers. And that starts, getting, that starts breaking everything. That's mm -hmm. why you want a standard in the first place. So that you want to make sure that you have everything from Buffalo, the first draft, what is this, draft AC? Well, this, that's what's interesting is they're not calling this pre-AC or draft AC. Just they're saying AC. it's 802.11 AC. So that makes me think they have more confidence that the AC, uh, the draft that's out right now is going to be the final draft. Oh, yeah, it's I mean, just it, not ratified yet. So you just got to wait around and hopefully it'll, it won't break anything when you actually go with the firmware upgrade. I know my router a long time ago, I'm not going to name names, kind of sucked at draft N and mm -hmm. the upgrade did nothing to fix it. So oh. I'm, I hope so it was one better. of those things you might have wanted to wait for had you yeah. known a little bit more about the process. Yeah, if if all goes well, this is basically an investment in a 802.11 router that will become an 802.11 AC router as all of the devices catch up to it. It'll be in a cocoon, it'll have wings. Frankly, it's, you know, $180. And you get to impress your annoying friend. Little expensive for a router, but if you want to be future-proofed, you know, but all kidding aside. Is it that much more expensive than what you would go without the... I mean, granted, you're taking a gamble on the future-proofing that it might be totally just snake oil, but are you paying, what, $30 more, $50 more? Like, at that price, I'm like, eh, what the hell? Who knows? Maybe it'll even last that long. Well, you're you're one, the 1%, though. I mean, a lot of us don't have that much money, so... And please, <laughs> technological... Dude, wouldn't his goal play? I mean, you, could, you could, for instance... Capital gains taxes. You could afford to buy your movies instead of download them illegally... Uh, but <laughs> Microsoft is trying to back a new effort called Pirate Pay to work with Disney and Sony, among others, to stop people from downloading movies illegally. Uh, what Pirate Pay does is kind of what Media Defender did. Poses as a BitTorrent user and attempts to confuse the network and cause disconnections. Pirate Pay was given 1 million rubles because it's, it's actually a Russian company. I'm not just making that up. That's about $100,000 uh, from a seed investment fund set up by Microsoft Seed Financing Fund. Uh, it was started three years ago when developers were building a traffic management solution for ISPs and found out that they were killing BitTorrent traffic with their with their traffic management and they're like hey we could make that a product all on its own they recently tried it out by trying to block illegal downloads of a russian film visutsky thanks to god i'm alive made by disney 
They were able to block 44,845 downloads, they say. Uh, Richard Clayton from the University of Cambridge told the BBC that, sure, this might work in the short term, but peer-to-peer networks do adapt and share information about bogus peers. So he's not sure it'd be able to work in the long term. So this isn't shutting down just BitTorrent traffic in general or reducing BitTorrent's effectiveness. It's specifically targeting movies that they know there's no authorized copies being distributed on BitTorrent. Is that correct? They go after a particular movie, say uh, The Hurt Locker, for instance, right? That's the one that they're all going to court over. Instead, they could have said, let's go after all the trackers we can find for Bit for uh, The Hurt Locker and poison them. We'll use pirate pay to just mess with the with the packets and with the seeding. Uh, they they won't they don't reveal exactly how they do it, but it seems to just kind of swamp the network with a bunch of bad data so that none of the downloads actually work. See, I, I'm weirdly very much okay with this insofar as as long as they are investing in some kind of uh, bad information arms race, as long as they're running distraction and their own campaigns to battle the piracy effectively, then at least they're not trying to use the hammer of law to draft clumsy, SOPA-like legislation. I would much, much rather see this. And who knows, you know, if, if, if you know, none of us are pro-piracy, but if, if they are able to muddy that marketplace, because as we've discussed on frame rate, Unfortunately, in many ways, the top quality experience when it comes to consuming downloads is on piracy, and we don't want it to be that way. So if they can hit it on two fronts by increasing the quality of the legitimate marketplace and muddying the waters of the illegal marketplace, then at, then at least they get their what they want without stupid SOPA-like legislation. Well, the, the difficulties around it are misidentification. Uh, so when do, when they make a mistake and think they're going after a file that's the bad file and it isn't, uh, it, that can happen. And the other is it just doesn't work. I mean, Media Defender was doing the same sort of principle. We're going to go poison the downloads. And the torrent trackers pretty much caught on to it, and it, it doesn't work very well now. They tried this with MP3s. Remember Madonna went out and put out a, a yeah. bunch of MP3s that had, like, messages in the middle of the song that said, you shouldn't steal stuff. That didn't stop MP3 piracy. In fact, we have given up trying to stop MP3 piracy. What the music industry is doing, I think, works better, which is give us a better product. So I don't know that... I, I, I get your point, well, Brian. Hey, but I, I don't know that this is actually helping at, at all. Well, okay, but look at it. We've talked about this before as well. What we're seeing in online video and piracy is very similar. It's almost like step for step. Everything's echoes from what we heard before. So now we're finally through that phase where they're trying to attack with misinformation. Well, and then maybe they'll figure out that the way to do it is with effective downloads that are affordable. I admire your optimism uh, that we're through that phase. You may be right. Maybe you're right. I hope you are. Let's move on to the news fuse. Kaspersky is helping out Apple. Wait, okay. Well, no. Wait, it looks like it wants to help. A no? Maybe it just wants to criticize Apple. Well, here's what we do know. Uh, Computing News quoted Kaspersky CTO Nikolai Grabenikov as saying, quote, Mac OS is really vulnerable, and Apple recently invited us to improve its security. We've begun an analysis of its vulnerabilities and the malware targeting it. Our first investigations show Apple doesn't pay enough attention to security. Sounds like they're helping Apple. But Kaspersky then told Ars Technica that the Computing News article was inaccurate and stated that its analysis was independent of Apple, but that Apple is open to working with Kaspersky. I would hope they would be. So Apple, hey, Apple invited, you're super vulnerable. You know what? It's probably his wording. He probably meant, we said, hey, Apple, we're going to do this independent study. And Apple said, yeah, go ahead. We want, we want to know what, We'd what you We'd love to find. know what you find. And he said they invited us and it made it sound like. We're having lunch. They're at together, an Italian restaurant. You know, everybody misinterpreted the signals. <laughs> They're just friends, okay? That's all there is to it. Intel CEO Paul Odellini talked about Intel's upcoming processors designed for smartphones. So say hello to the dual core Merrifield and single core 6331, which will both debut next year. Also, both use 22 nanometer process, but Intel said that it's looking at 14 nanometer in 2014. It just keeps getting smaller. Over the weekend, the Wall Street Journal found an API bug at Kickstarter that exposed 70,000 unlaunched projects. Data exposed included descriptions, goals, and videos, but not credit card numbers. Kickstarter said that only 48 of those projects were accessed. So they were just seeing projects before the projects were ready to be seen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Somebody explained it as, like, hacking into your future dreams. Wow. Because it was like, you know. It's pretty. 
big ideas people yeah. had that hadn't happened yet. NVIDIA and Intellectual Ventures picked up 500 patents related to 3G, 4G, and LTE technology from IP Wireless. And this got everybody speculating. Two companies will split ownership. NVIDIA gets a license to the patents it doesn't own and vice versa. IP Wireless also retains access to the patents it sold. Maybe NVIDIA's Tegra 3 processors will get some new wireless tech. Snazzy. Foxconn wants to clear something up. Okay. So listen up. Foxconn is not making the Apple HD TV. No, they said they're making the ITV. And let, well, no, they, they, they'll, they'll make it if, if they're asked to. China Daily reported Foxconn was working on the mythical Apple ITV, as Tom so eloquently likes to put it. However, a statement from Foxconn CEO says he made it very clear that he would neither confirm nor speculate about Foxconn's involvement in the product, which might not even exist. It obviously does, and I'm so excited. You know, if you're if you say the word Apple in your sentence, and you're an official who does business with Apple, I think the lesson today from Kaspersky and Foxconn is stop. Hmm. Apple said nothing. <laughs> move on there. Yeah. In a move, actually, Apple said something here. In a move to appease regulators mm-hmm. in several countries, Apple will drop 4G from the iPad name and use the term cellular. Ooh, that's catchy. So now you can get your new iPad with Wi-Fi plus cellular. 4G still appears in Apple's web pages, describing networks as 4G LTE, but that description is in North America only. Apple ran into those whole issues with 4G in the UK and Australia. Ladies and gentlemen, now batting in the World Series of IP cases, Oracle and Google. And they want to look into the patent infringement willingness issue in the current part of the trial. Uh, trial's in its second phase. That's the patent phase. The third phase focuses on damages. And if Google can prove that it isn't willfully infringing, that would impact the amount of damages Oracle could receive. We talked a little bit about this at the end of the week. Uh, and Judge Alsup has ruled now that willingness will be addressed in the second phase. So that could possibly toss out the third phase depending on how things go. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit said that a district court erred in a ruling that Apple could not block sales of Samsung tablets while their legal dispute proceeded in court. Sounds like good news for Apple, but wasn't all good news. The appeals court also sided with Samsung, saying the lower court was right to deny Apple's preliminary injunctions to stop sales of Samsung smartphones based on other patents. Bloomberg reports Facebook plans to stop taking orders for its initial public offering tomorrow, and TechCrunch reports that the IPO may happen Friday, May 18th, with Mark Zuckerberg ringing the opening bell for the NASDAQ from Facebook's new headquarters in Menlo Park. Among the folks excited is Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, who told Bloomberg he would invest in Facebook at any price. Get ready for the clarification tomorrow that Steve Wozniak is not, in fact, investigating and investing in Facebook. Because everybody's reporting Wozniak's going to buy Facebook. And he said, I would invest in Facebook at any price. Yeah, based on the price that they've said. He didn't say he will invest in Facebook, though. He didn't say he wouldn't. No, he didn't. That's true. He'll send a note out from his Windows phone and people will freak out, too, on top of that. He did say, stop talking about me and do the randomizer. Randomizer. Because a man who may or may not be Steve Wozniak, but isn't, in fact, it's New Jersey's Dave Herbin, uh, has surgically embedded magnets into his left wrist. You heard me right. To keep his 16 gigabyte iPod Nano right there on his wrist anytime he wants it. Okay, so oh, that dear. oh yeah. Now this is a guy with uh, with some tats. He's got some sleeves. He so does, he's, he's, he does the ear stretching thing too. So yeah, he's, he's, not he's necessarily... fine with body modification. Right. You, you should also point out that he did it to himself. You can see on the video in graphic bloody detail as he cuts holes in his wrist and implants these uh, these these. I guess they're not subdermal. They're they're just implants. Well, hey, you know, if you're gonna well, go through it, you might as well show us. And how he's you a did tattoo it. artist, so I imagine he's given himself tattoos before. So. For him, this is probably not as big of a jump as it would be for me. I just so, want, I the placement of the magnet seems really important. And what happens when devices, you know, evolve and change shape or get well, smaller or something? You know, the thing, yeah, I guess you're right. But r- they're roughly about this size. I mean, you look at all of these watch type things that are coming out. Mm-hmm. Body around, modification is a bit more permanent than technology sizes, though. Yeah, but the size of a watch stays pretty stable, right? <laughs> I mean, I feel like you're like getting convinced that this is a good idea. I think it's a great idea. <laughs> I think this is, as an art piece, this is phenomenal on multiple reasons. First of all, if there's any doubt that that we all want very badly to become Borg, uh, the, I mean, this erases it. Look how fast we're working towards making this happen. I say we as a society, obviously, he's an outlier. But second of all, how punk rock of all the times to decide you're going to put implants so that you can have a strapless wristwatch. Yeah, like like twenty minutes before a refresh of a new iPod. He can Nano take them out. out. 
And it's yeah. going to be like, he just doesn't care. He's like, he's like, man, I, he's like, so what? If it's wrong, it's wrong. It's like, this is it for now. And I'm the first and, and it's awesome. Yeah. Can, he's, he's not planning on replacing his iPod Nano every year. He's more committed to that than that. Or he could just put smaller magnets inside the magnets and the smaller magnets and he'll just have a giant piece of metal. Actually, there. I believe Apple's going to sell a dongle that you can attach to existing implanted magnets that will convert <laughs> it to the next generation. Of and then he can take his iPod Nano and sell it on Gazelle. Uh, let's take a break and thank our sponsor, which happens to be Gazelle. Uh, you want the new iPad? You want the latest iPod Nano? You want an iPhone, Android smartphone? Sell your old one. It'll make things cheaper. You can walk away some, with some cash and trade up. Go to gazelle.com, get a risk-free quote. The quote's good for 30 days, so do it today because like, gadgets don't get more valuable over time. They get less valuable. And Gazelle's simple and fast. You go to G-A-Z-E-L-L-E.com, type in the name of your gadget, see what it's worth, They'll pay for the shipping, and as soon as you send it in, you get your check fast. You can actually get paid by PayPal. It's even faster. Or if you want an Amazon gift card, you get 5% more. Great way to get some cash to put towards all those latest devices. Uh, quotes vary by models, so be sure to enter the correct model on the website. Get your quote. Uh, and just go and get some money. Like when, you, like when you drive a car off the lot. You know when you buy a car and then drive it off the lot and it goes down by $2,000 and you try to drive back on the lot and return it and they won't take it because it, it, it depreciated as soon as you started driving it. Gadgets lose their value over time. So go to gazelle.com, get the best offer, find out what your gadget is worth. It only takes a minute at gazelle.com for your risk-free quote today. I've sold a bunch of gadgets to Gazelle. Great stuff. Let's see what's happening on the calendar. Tom, I'm glad you want to know because there's quite a few things. Um, starting with Diablo 3, which launches tomorrow, <laughs> May 15th. <coughs> It's too bad that you're feeling so sick or else maybe you'd play it. You're not looking so uh, good. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to try to come in tomorrow, though, you guys. Yeah. Maybe it's the most distracted <laughs> episode of TNT ever. Claritin or something. <laughs> also tomorrow, new carrier alert, Voyager Mobile starts up service. Uh, it's an MVNO on the Sprint Network, and it's teasing a frequent talker program. Are you a yapper? Uh, you might be given perks for talking a lot. That's not actually their, their campaign. Well, I almost sounded like it, though. That's very good. Are you a be. yapper? Well, we want you. So if you talk a lot, you might get phone upgrades, months of uh, free months of service, air mileage, things like that. It's, it's basically because people use the phone less and less for talking. So it's the sort of thing that they can offer. Plans start very low at 19 uh, bucks uh, for unlimited voice. If you've got a smartphone, it's more likely you'd pay the base of 40 bucks for unlimited voice, text, and WiMAX data. GameStop is good. Going to begin selling Steam wallet cards also tomorrow in store for Valve's Steam platform. At least at first, it'll be in either $20 or $50 denominations. So that turned out to be true. There mm -hmm. you go. See, sometimes rumors turn out to be true. That's right. Rumors aren't always false, or else they would just be lies. SpaceX mission gets NASA approval. Takeoff is set for May 19th, everybody. <laughs> And finally, wireless emergency alert texts are going live this month. What are they? Well, they're free location-based. It's a free location-based service that sends an SMS if you if you opt in to subscribers who are in areas that might be experiencing tornadoes or floods, earthquakes, those sorts of things that you need to know about emergency stuff. Um, and a lot of uh, carriers are participating: AT and T, Verizon, Cellcom, Cricket, Sprint, Nextel, T-Mobile, U.S. Cellular, and that's all for now. Mr. Worf, what is that? Incoming message. Oh, thank you. Uh, looks like it's an incoming message from Marcel. What do you have to say for yourself, Marcel? Hello, this is Marcel from Toronto, Canada. I'm just calling to congratulate you guys on 500 episodes. You guys and gals have been great teachers, entertainers, and you really know how to make your audience feel welcome. Although no one replies when I send my message via the TV, but that's okay. That's something we can work off for the next we got 500 more episodes to get it right. Uh, hey, yeah. Congratulations. It's our 500th episode. This is our Wait, what? celebrations. Right here. 500? That can't be. That's so many. Yeah. We haven't even hit two years yet. Wow. That's awesome. Did it in our sleep, literally. Um, yeah, I was sleeping through like three quarters of those 500 episodes. I think I'm is just kidding. This is so cool. I think this is my fifth time to join you guys, which means uh, that I guess I, I represent 1%. You are the 1%. Of the see, see, I told you before. Hey, yeah. Thomas Ritter. Occupy Schwitz House. Let's move on to some behind. Thank you, Marcel. And thanks to everybody else, actually, who's uh, kept us around 
for 500 episodes, as costly as we are. Let's go to the emails. Russ writes into TNT at twit.tv and says, I will say that you missed the real reason that people will want to prioritize their posts. He's talking about the pay for promotion that Facebook's been testing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Weddings, births, graduations, all those special days that come once or twice in a lifetime. Think about your feed, how fast everything flies by. If someone posted an engagement, within hours, it could be a screen or two down the line. For just a buck or two, Facebook will hold it towards the top so your friends can know what's going on. Well, I don't think that many people would use this. I think that for special moments, it is truly needed. Uh, okay, I guess. I just, again, I feel like there's a birth announcement. People will see it. They're your friends on Facebook, right? It's word travels fast. Let's ask the breeders. You get enough likes, it'll it'll rise up to the top. Yeah. What do you say, uh, breeders? Because we don't really know. Ayas? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if my friends were paying to keep their weddings, births, and graduations up there, I'd probably get irritated with them. Because if that's all they're talking about, that's all I'm going to see from them, I'm going to start getting really annoyed. That's one of the reasons I started cutting people from Facebook in the first place. Right. Because they only talk about other things like... We're having more kids. Like, I don't care. So yeah. if, no. if somebody should really think about the I don't care factor. I would like to ignore this. Maybe they get a refund if I ignore it. How about that? That's no, how it should see, work. Let me tell you, I think this is brilliant, and it's a step in the right direction. It's a good observation because the look at the, the land rush to artificial scarcity that we experience on the Internet. We have all of these things that are for real scarce in real life. You know, like, it's expensive to send out fancy graduation announcements. And as a result, when you get one, you're like, wow, they, they, spent, they spent five bucks on this. This is a big deal to them. They're very excited, and it means something. And likewise, if they're going to create a structure in Facebook that allows me to do that, where it's, where it's like whether, whether it's one of these big announcements, I don't care if you care or not. The fact that I'm spending money to get fancy crap for you to look at shows you how much I care about it. And that's what it, that's what the structure means in real life. And that's exact, exactly what they're simulating in Facebook. I think it's brilliant. That's like the I, newspaper announcements where you're like, look, who's got it engaged? Uh, yeah. It's like, look, here, we'll put this up. That people is sort of the same will, thing. People will pay for it and it's there. Although, ideally, the way the Facebook algorithm works, when everyone's excited and commenting on your post, it stays up at the top that's anyway. That's not what I'm so. saying. It's like, that's... But, but that's also what happens in real life. When you pay a lot of money to have an advertisement put up, everyone talks about it, and so it stays sticky in yeah, people's right. minds as well. Gotcha. I mean, it's again, it's tracking one for one to real life. So they're very insecure. It's going to be up there. I know it is. I know you saw it. Look Listen. at my baby. <laughs> <laughs> don't look away. I don't have a baby. Not yet. But I see a lot of other people's babies. And that's the end of Tech News Today, episode 500. <laughs> Sarah Lane. It's a good place to stop. Does not have a baby. Uh, <laughs> and if you would like to submit ideas for stories... Uh, go to our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. It is the place where folks let us know what stories they would like us to talk about on the show every day. And we do take a look at that. In fact, that's where that uh, pay pirate pay story came from. We did see it other places, but I found it on the subreddit. So go in there, submit, and vote. Because it's the one that get the most votes are the ones we actually pay most attention to. And thank you, Brian Brushwood, for writing the Scam School book, a service to our great nation and, frankly, all of humanity. Dude, scamschoolbook.com. A bunch of people are asking, saying, I don't like iTunes. I don't like Amazon. You could get it totally DRM free at scamschoolbook.com. And if you, uh, in fact, if you, let's say you're like, ah, man, this may be an award winning book that everyone's given five stars reviews to and just got reviewed on the Huffington Post, but I don't feel like spending 10 whole dollars for it. Well, guess what? If you wait till book two comes out on June 19th, I'm going to drop book one for that one day to 99 cents. You're like Microsoft. So you, yeah, exactly. But then that way you could get two books. That would be like almost 200 tricks for 11 bucks. But it's uh, uh, June 19th. It's going to be the biggest thing in the world for me. It's amazing. I'm so proud of these books. And they're, people are saying really nice things about it's like them. like five and a half cents a trick. It's amazing. See? Uh, so, thank you, Brian, uh, for being on the show. It's good to have you, man. Of course. And thank you, folks, for watching or listening and sticking with us for 500 episodes. Hey. Here's to 500 more. Let us know what you think. Should we do 500 more? Email us, tnt at twit.tv. Uh, you can find us on the web at twit.tv slash tnt. You can call us, leave us a voicemail, 260-TNT-SHOW. And, of course, you can watch us live every day at 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific at live.twit.tv. Chris Knoll joins us tomorrow. It's Chad Johnson's last day filling in for Jason Howell, so don't miss it. We'll see you then.